Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to the first in our winter webinar series uh, on behalf of the European Rhinologic Society and our sponsors, uh, Olympus. Um, it's a great pleasure this evening to uh, welcome you to the first of our um, series. Uh, this one is a, a facial plastic session. Uh, in the coming months, we're going to have sessions on uh, rhinology uh, and also on uh, skull base. So without any further ado, I'm going to pass you over to uh, my colleague and co-moderator, uh, Yanis, uh, to introduce the panel and take things from uh, there. Can I just remind everybody, we've got a Q&A uh, and please uh, pop your questions on and we'll answer those in the uh, final half hour. So good evening. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I would like also to welcome and uh, all the, the participants, all the distinguished speakers from different places of uh, Europe. We will start our session with uh, George Mireas from Athens, Greece. He will uh, cover uh, uh, the topic managing of the bony vault uh, with uh, PSO. This is something new. It's a development of the last years and uh, George will uh, 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 talk about uh, this uh, topic and give us uh, the advantages uh, using a piezo in rhinoplasty. The second speaker will be Frank Riddle. You know that in the last years there was a discussion uh, to, uh, between different techniques in tip surgery, grafting, no grafting, grafting, suture techniques. And uh, Frank uh, uh, Riddle from Germany, he's the treasurer of the European Academy of Facial Plastic Surgery. He will cover this topic and I think this is also something very, very interesting. And of course, our president, and I very, feel very uh, privileged to, to introduce him, the president of the European Academy of Facial Plastic Surgery, Hesham Saleh. He will also talk about um, uh, the final contouring and camouflage techniques in rhinoplasty. You know how important, and uh, all of us know how important this topic is because not always uh, all our results and all our dorsums are regular. We see irregularities. We see, we see uh, uh, something, uh, uh, something uh, special in, uh, in the dorsum and in the tip. And we use very often uh, camouflage procedures to camouflage these uh, areas. And the last speaker will be uh, um, Dario Pertosi from Italy. Uh, he will talk about medical rhinoplasty. You know, this is also something uh, special and uh, uh, trendy because uh, many patients ask us in our private offices if we can change the shape of the nose without uh, use uh, uh, as a knife, uh, as scarless rhinoplasty or using uh, fillers. So please, uh, George uh, Mireas will start with this presentations. A presentation, please keep the time in order to have enough time for a productive discussion in the end. We will have the, all the questions. We will have the questions and the discussion in the end of uh, uh, the presentations. Please, George, start with your uh, talk. Okay. Thank you, Yanis, for the your kind words. Just a moment. Okay. So good evening, ladies and gentlemen from Athens, Greece. I'm George Mireas, and I'm really happy to be here today with you, participating in this first webinar of the rhinoplasty series of the URS. URS. In the next 15 minutes, I will show you how you can easily and safely manage bony vault problems by using ultrasonic piezo. Let's start with the common bony vault problems, which are a hump, a white nose, a deviated nose and some local tissues. These are the standard surgery sets used for more than a surgery now, so chisels, scissors and osteoforms. This is the piezo, a device that converts electricity to ultrasound vibrations and it uses tips like these rasps, saws and drills of different sizes, shapes and angulations. The key feature of the piezo device is that you can control the tissue that is going to be affected by its use. So by adjusting the frequency at the 25 to 29 kilohertz, we can harm only nasal bones and, uh, and rib cartilages and leaving totally intact all the soft tissues of the nose. 
a comparison of the two different techniques, the standard rhinoplasty in red and the piezo rhinoplasty in blue. The first difference is the visibility. We usually, uh, when we deliver um, an open or closed rhinoplasty with standard um, equipment, we have to dissect this the central area. In contrast with piezo, we go with full deglobin from the we dissect from the one nasophageal group to the other. Of course, the problem is not the dissection itself, it's the vision, the visibility. In um, standard techniques, we usually, uh, um, I could say that uh, uh, we don't see anything. We operate totally blindfolded. But in contrast with piezo, uh, we operate bones uh, totally until, until complete direct vision. The second difference is how you can sculpt the bones. For example, in this situation, we can, we almost always go when you use a standard equipment, the classic, the standard um, open roof. But in contrast with piezo, while we preserve the ULCs, we uh, avoid this uh, situation. Here is the standard and here is the piezo. You can see here, I'm trying to remove the covering bony cap and I preserve the upper lateral cartilages. I use scrapers and, and rasps. While here, I had to remove and block the osteocartilaginous wall. You can see here the open roof and here it is not an open roof CPS. The third difference is how you can control the osteotomy lines. Even in the heads of the most qualifying surgeon, you can see something like this, especially if you have to deal with extra fine, extra thin nasal bones or in revision surgeries. In contrast with piezo, we, by using these delicate tiny tips, we have almost absolute control of the um, osteotomy lines. The fourth and last difference is how you can uh, deal with mobile bones. In cases, for example, like this one, we had to wait about six to 12 months in order to proceed. Now with piezo, we can proceed immediately. Of course, sometimes there is a need for some more bone correction at the end of the surgery or just after the osteotomies. Uh, this is something extremely difficult and risky to uh, be performed by using standard um, equipment. Of course, it is very easy to do it by using piezo. I'm gonna show you right now. Here, I am trying to show you how we usually start to narrow a wide nose or move the nasal walls. We uh, start with a low to low uh, lateral osteotomy, partial one. We check this with uh, the elevator. And if the movement is satisfactory, we can start. If we need more uh, movement or more narrowing, we elongate this low to low lateral and make it a complete one. If we need even more narrowing, I will show you later, we can add some other osteotomies too. This is the last part of the surgery, the final contouring. You can see I, I can use this rasp, these tiny rasps, even on mobile bones very easily. Here, I had to use dies. Of course, we can use dies with piezo, but uh, the, this thing doesn't work the other way. We cannot um, uh, do your rasping at the end of the surgery. It's very risky with standard techniques. Let's go to the surgery sequence of the piezo. I'll explain you first uh, the new semi bony vault, the SBV concept. And based on that, I'm going to guide you see, through the six step SBV surgery algorithm. The SBV concept first. It's a fact that the two sides of the nose differ from each other. So we have often to deal with different issues and consequently, and 
consequently to treat them individually. Our goal was to develop an easy way to describe each condition accurately and briefly and communicate with colleagues with precision. I used a th the theoretical midline that separates the nose into right and left semi noses and used it to divide the bony vault, the BV, into two uh, different uh, semi bony vaults, the two SBVs. Then I used some qualifying prefixes here in front of the SBV, like XSBV, SSBV, etc., to describe specific characteristics like shape, inclination, and more. Following this, um, uh, the main idea, we can, just a moment, we can see that the uh, base of the nose can be convex, straight, or concave. So we have XSBV, SSBV, and VSBV, respectively. The width of the bony base can be wide, or narrow, or normal. So in this situation, we use W and N as prefix. The nasal walls can be normal, the blue, extremely vertical or extremely flat. So we have P and F as blue. At the dorsal area, we can see that the nasal walls can be closed, the blue, or open, the red one. And finally, if there is a hum, we use the prefix H in front of the BV, the bone wall. If there is no hump, we don't use any prefix. All the prefixes are gathered together here. Let's go now to the six step SBV algorithm. In step number one, we manage any hump issues. We can have a hump or not. If there is a hump, we can use rhinosculpture in order to remove. As I showed you earlier, we can use scrapers or rasps to do so. Of course, our goal is to maintain the cartilaginous vault and avoid this uh, situation, the open roof. This is not an open roof and this is an open roof. In step number two, we manage the inclination of the nasal walls. The nasal holes can be, as I told you earlier, normal, vertical, or flat. In vast majority of cases, we have normal inclination. In cases of extra flattened, the classic ethnic nose, we perform the low to high lateral osteotomy in combination with a transverse and a medial or paramedial oblique. This combination gives us this inward turn, a verticalization that we want. We are trying usually to maintain a five millimeter long intact bone bridge as a hinge for better stabilization. Sometimes we need to add some spreader grafts or flaps. In cases of extra vertical nasal walls, we can use custom osteotomies and add fracture of the base. In step number three, we manage the shape of the bony base. The shape, the bony base can be convex, straight or concave. So we have XSBV, SSBV, and VSB. In cases of thin convex based SBV, like this one, we can perform some vertical, horizontal, angulated, or even crisscross osteotomies in order to eliminate this convex. In cases of thick or normal nasal walls, we can rasp them, the nasal walls, of course, in order to eliminate the convex stick and go here. Let's focus now on the concave base SBV. If we have medium concavity, we can use the various camouflage techniques like dice, fascia, and sorry, and PRF in order to cover this concavity. In cases of high asymmetry, like this one, we can use vertical, horizontal, crisscross osteotomies and spreader grafts and outfracture. In cases 
of high concavity, we can use a combination of rhino sculpture, osteotomies, and sometimes a spreadograph short labs. In step number four, we manage the width of the bony base. The base can be wide or narrow or normal. It's the same. So we have WS wide straight SBV or narrow straight SBV. In cases of thick or normal nasal walls, we can use rhino sculpture, usually with hard rasps, in order to eliminate. If we need more narrowing, we can start our classic osteotomies. We begin with this one. It's a little, there's a little delay, sorry. With this one, the low to low lateral, it's a partial one, and we can actually see this medial movement of the nasal walls. If the, uh, this movement or the narrowing is satisfactory, we can start. If we need more narrowing or more movement, we can elongate it and make it a complete one. And we go here. If we need more narrowing, we can add a transverse osteotomy like this one, different tips for this osteotomy, and medial or paramedial oblique like this one. This, this gives us the famous U-shaped osteotomy and gives us also the medial relocation of the nasal walls that we want. We maintain this intact bone bridge of five millimeters long, and sometimes if we need more movement or narrowing, we can unify these three osteotomies. In this case, we sometimes want to drill some holes in the bones and pass some sutures through them for better stabilization. In step number five, we turn our attention to the dorsal area. The nasal holes can be closed or open. If they are closed, we don't have we don't have to do anything if they are open we start with our medial or paramedial oblique osteotomies and and if this is not satisfactory we can add this uh, this is a modified uh, osteotomy of mine. I called it satellite osteotomy, where I produce this satellite bone. This is a, uh, this is a small bone that we can uh, rotate it, and sometimes I can uh, I have to use some sutures through the this satellite bone. And the final step is when we can uh, deal with some minor local deformities and perform a contour. To do so, we can use rhino sculpture or camouflage. For smoothing and finesse, we usually use this kind of tips, the rasps, fine rasp of the piezo. And of course, for camouflage, we can use whatever technique it suits you better. And all of this to achieve a new compact, a smooth or so cartilaginous unit. And finally, don't forget in about to join us in about six uh, weeks from now, the um, first ever uh, organized World Rhinoplasty Day when European and Greek rhinologic societies joined forces. And of course, the big event next year in Thessaloniki where we hope we are going to finally organize the ARS 2021. I'm sure you are going to love it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, George, for this very, very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, there are a few questions, but as I said, we will discuss in the end of the presentations uh, uh, all the questions. So I will pass to, to Frank. Please, Frank, give you us uh, your talk about trends in nasal tip uh, surgery.
Oh, I'm sorry. I have to find the, the first slide. Yeah, well, first of all, I really like to, to thank you for the invitation. And it's a great honor for me to participate in this wonderful uh, webinar. So thank you very much. Second, I like to congratulate for this wonderful uh, overview and algorithm uh, uh, of using the piezo. It was very interesting and fascinating for me. And I really love algorithms, so it's very helpful to think that way. Um, yeah, now I like to talk about some maybe new aspects on tip surgery. Um, yeah, and as you all know, or let's say from my point of view, tip surgery is one of the most challenging uh, part of of rhinoplasty and probably probably you all know this famous quote who masters tip masters rhinoplasty um, it's very complex and um, very difficult to create a wonderful and harmonious tip because to provide the optimal attention of the nasal tip the surgeon must have a complete understanding of the underlying dynamic anatomy responsible for creating position and shape of the nasal tip. And one thing which is, or one aspect which is quite new is the understanding um, of, the, of the nasal ligaments, mainly the tip ligaments. And uh, thinking about them and introducing the concepts of ligament preservation or redesign into um, tips in the routine of tip surgery. This is what came into the focus within maybe the last two or three years and is quite interesting to, to learn and think about it. So it's on one, on one hand, it's the which is called the Pitangui ligament. It's not a true ligament, but it can be used as a ligament structure. And um, second, here on the left side, the Pitangui ligament and the scroll ligaments. So there's a vertical and a horizontal scroll ligament in the scroll area. And it's really worth to trying to redesign or to preserve this um, delicate uh, area during tip surgery. Um, so usually I dissect uh, beneath this, it, actually it's a SMES structure. And so it's uh, important to, to um, uh, dissect um, sub SMES. Uh, so it's possible to um, preserve these structures. So you can see here, Scroll ligaments are intact, um, sub-smass uh, dissection, and um, it gives strong support to the uh, structures of the nasal tip. And here is Pitangui ligament. I come to that later, uh, how to use the Pitangui ligament. Um, a, a second step during um, tip surgery is cephalic trim. Cephalic trimming of the lower lateral cartilage is, in, in the most cases, it is performed to refine a broad nasal um, tip. And um, it is important um, to that the uh, remaining width of the lateral crust um, gives structural integrity to the tip and to the cartilage and to the to the nasal ala, and usually, most of the search or many surgeons uh, they uh, perform um, cephalic trimming in a more or less parallel fashion. So we have the same width here or more lateral of the um, lateral crust, but um, we investigated or we we thought about. Uh, beautiful tips, and we found that it is more important 
to do it in a non-parallel uh, fashion. Um, it should be in the dome region. Here is the new dome marked. In the dome region, we should have a width about six or seven millimeters. And then the width should increase the more lateral uh, we are at the lateral cross. And this gives strength to the ala and let the tip look more beautiful. Um, and in the, the, the second aspect of using this kind of uh, cephalic trimming is that it is possible to, um, to handle the scroll region or the scroll area. And there are just two options for the scroll ligaments. One is to cut and repair or second is to fully preserve the scroll ligaments as demonstrated before. I think this is an uh, interesting and important aspect of tip surgery. And another or alternative technique to reduce the size of the lateral crust by in addition, um, not uh, touching the scroll ligaments here is a, another technique, which we tried many times. And uh, the idea of this technique is not to perform cephalic trimming in the cephalic border of the lateral crust, but to perform an a, a elliptical excision of cartilage in the middle of the lateral crust. And then we um, we flip this excised cartilage on the um, um, here like a turn-in flap. So it uh, helps to increase the strength of the lateral crust by doubling the cartilage and it reduces the size of the lateral crust. And I show this in a, in a short video, you see the incision of the cartilage and then the turn in flip of the this piece of cartilage um, using two, one or two sutures to fix it. And then you can close the gap and reduce the size of the lateral crust by this technique. So you, we have more strength of the lateral crust, a smaller size of the lateral or width of the lateral crust and we fully preserve the, um, the scroll region by using this technique. I just jump a little bit. Here you can see closure of, of the, the gap. And so the width of the cartilage is decreased. Oops. Uh, now I want to talk about some aspects of tip refinement. Um, what is the difference between this pre-op on table situation and the post-op, immediate post-op situation uh, of such a patient? Or here is a second patient, pre-op on the left, post-op on the right. And one aspect is the, um, the shape of the tip, which is more rounded at the beginning of the surgery and more elliptical at the end of the surgery. And the smaller this width of this elliptical uh, shape is, the finer the tip looks. And if we remove the, the skin and see what is the underlying structures, then you can see this rounded shape of the dome at the beginning of the surgery and this angled uh, shape of the dome by using, for example, um, sutures uh, in the dome region. Um, so it, it is possible to define the tip by using tip sutures or tip grafts. These are, from my point of view, the only two ways to create a uh, fine defined tip. And if we use 
uh, tips futures, it is important to use um, the, uh, which is called cranial tip future. Milos Kovacevic and Jochen Wurm described this maybe four or five years ago. Um, and it is important to perform a mattress future, which is um, performed vertical and not horizontal. And by using this vertical shaped mattress suture in the cranial part of the dome region, um, you, you get a finer dome on one side and you elevate the caudal border of the lateral crust, which gives support to the nasal ala and the, the ala rim. And this is very important to create the domes by using this vertically shaped uh, mattress suture, which Milos and Jochen called the um, cranial tip suture. So in the cranial part of, uh, of the dome region, um, a vertical mattress suture is placed, as you can see here in this video. And then uh, the the uh, lateral uh, the caudal border of the lateral crust is elevated a little bit the the axis of the lateral crust is rotated and this gives support to the ala rim so it is very important to avo avoid um, yeah losing support and uh, have pinching of the, of the tip by using for example uh, horizontal mattress sutures instead of vertical shaped mattress sutures. And um, the second uh, aspect is that by using these uh, tip sutures in the right way, it is important to have a wide angle between the, uh, the two new created domes. And in the side view, uh, this uh, makes the um, uh, the distance between here point A and point B as small as possible, and this makes a very fine and defined tip in the side view. So, as you can see here, they are the domes are almost parallel. Uh, no, always <laughs> in the, in the same axis. So the the angle is very wide. And this is uh, important that in the side view, we have a well-defined uh, nasal tip. You see here in the beginning, the distance between A and B is much larger than after creating fine domes by using these vertical mattress sutures. So here are just some examples for um, tip for patient or one example for uh, a uh, well-defined tip. Another asp aspect, which is from my point of view, very important to consider is the size of the nostrils. Because many patients, mainly patients with over-projected uh, nasal tips um, have huge nostrils. And the, the ratio between inf the intra tip and the nostril is um, not harmonious. So as you can see here, for example, in that patient, you see that um, the nostril size is much bigger than in the end of the surgery and the ratio between uh, nostril size and intra tip, which should be about 60 to 40%. Uh, this is from my point of view, um, harmonious and balanced. Uh, and looks very nice for the patient. So here's an example, overprotected nose, which with uh, large nostrils and after surgery, it's almost a 60 to 40 ratio uh, of nostril to infratip. Second case here, large nostrils, short infratip, um, and here more balanced 60 to 40. Um, and here is a male patient. Well, the quality is not that, not, not that good. I'm sorry for that. But you can see here large nostrils and a very short infratip. 
and at the end, or finally, a more balanced ratio between nostril and infratip. And one thing, one aspect which I think is very important, mainly for female patients, many of them desire a, a um, straight dorsum, but a tip level which is a little bit above the level of the dorsum. So they want to have a supra tip break and the break point here, uh, which is marked by this arrow, which makes the the nose looks a little bit more female. So I think this is the reason why many female patients desire a supra tip, tip break. And to create a supra tip break and to avoid supra tip fullness, which I think is one of the big, big problems in, in rhinoplasty surgery, um, how to deal this thick skin um, in the supra tip area is to use and to re-adapt or redesign the pitangui ligament. And usually I um, grab the end of the pitangui ligament through this gap here and pull, pull the pitangui ligament. And by pulling the, the ligament, I pull the supra tip skin to the cartilage and close the dead space um, in the supra tip area, which helps to um, create a um, supra tip break and to avoid supra tip fullness uh, in the healing process. So here you can see the difference. Here, the, the um, Pitangui ligament is still in place in the suprasip area. And after pulling the, the Pitangui ligament, even in such a thick skin patient, a suprasip break is created. And then the, I, I reduce the size of the Pitangui ligament and suture it here um, to the connective tissue. And uh, yeah, by that, it's very helpful to create such a supra tip break. Um, it creates tension and it, it closes that space in the supra tip area. And it's a concept which works in thin skin patients and even in thick skin patients, it contributes to avoid supra tip fullness as much as possible. Um, here you also see an example of huge supratip fullness, thick skin patient, and a slight supratip break uh, and tension in the supratip area by readapting Pitangui ligament. So here's just an example for a female looking supratip break nose. Second case, just a small supratip break, but I think it it's helpful or it contributes to a more female look in, in some patients. And last aspect I want to mention is um, ala rim support and uh, soft triangle. So which is very, or an aspect which is very helpful at the end of the operation to see uh, a light reflex along um, the border of the soft triangle um, and yeah how can we create such a light reflex it's important you see here this angulation and at the end a nice shaped light reflex at the end of the operation so this is this can be created by supporting the ala rim for example by using ala contour grafts which i really like and i use in many of my cases, ALA contour or ALA rim grafts, very thin uh, strips of cartilage, or oh, sorry, which are placed in the pocket in the ALA rim. And this is very helpful to uh, give support to the ALA rim and to create a nice shape and look of the ALA rim. Here you can see a patient with 
ALA retraction after a previous surgery and by supporting the ALA rim, oh, sorry, with uh, rim grafts, you can treat such an ALA retraction very sim simply. And in the frontal view, you see the effect of these ALA rim grafts. It gives the, the tip and the nose a more three-dimensional aspect and um, yeah, it it, um, it is important to have a a smooth transition from the ala to the tip, um, and not to see such pinching uh, as here on the right side and even on the left side, and it's very helpful to support the uh, the rim. Tip stabilization is also important to secure. The, the position, the new position of the tip. And this can be uh, done by using um, the caudal septum, suturing medial crura to the caudal septum. And if the caudal septum is too short, I think it's important to, to use an extension graft um, to make it possible to suture medial crura to the septum. I'm, I'm personally not a great fan of columella struts. I like septal extension grafts much more. And uh, it is important to, uh, to fix medial crua to the septum um, um, as basal as possible. So not here, better here, because this makes the tips uh, still look natural and a little mobile and not too stiff. This is also from my point of view, an important aspect. So what is my take home message? Um, as, you, uh, as you saw, there are many, many techniques to create a fine and natural and harmonious nasal tip. And I think it's very, very important to understand each individual um, effect of your maneuver and the additive effects of each tip modifying maneuver. And, and then, uh, yeah, you can, hopefully win this great challenge of tip surgery. Thank you very much for the invitation and thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Frank, for this uh, really interesting aspect in uh, tip surgery. So I pass to Hesham. He will give a talk about final contouring and camouflage techniques in uh, rhinoplasty. Thank you very much, Yanis. And thank you, Yanis and Sean, for the invitation for the ERS uh, webinar. It's really nice to be here with all my friends. So I'm going to talk about final contouring and camouflaging, something that not many people talk about, and I really like to talk about it because it's an important subject. So camouflaging and rhinoplasty is used to contour and also to correct minor or moderate asymmetries or irregularities. Uh, and you can't often find that this is a technique that is very easy to do and other things were un inadequate. These are the things I use in my personal practice and most people use as well that for final contouring and camouflaging. Cartilage, crushed or non-crushed or paste or pate, as you like to call it, and definitely fascia or something similar like dermographs, permacolor alloderm. So I'm gonna show every one of them separately and then talk about examples. So the cartilage I use usually uh, from the septum most of the time, but sometimes from the ear. And I'd use crushed cartilage to soften contours, especially in the middle third, and especially in the thin skin. And it can be used to fill defects anywhere in the nasal structure, including the tip. Cartilage paste here, put a paper by Frank and uh, Milos, Jokom, and uh, Greg Brand about the cartilage paste they, uh, they, when they uh, fix it with fibrin gel. I've been using this for a while, for a long time now. I call it pate or paste. And I, I basically, I've been just mixing it with saline. You make powder like this in that video here. You just keep scraping it with the 15 blade or 10 blades and you get a lot of powder and you can mix it with uh, glue or with just blood uh, uh, or with anything else similar that make it stick and you can use it to fill any defects anywhere. And these micro uh, uh, the cells are actually survived. They, they are alive and been tested before. And then this fascia. Fascia is obviously one of the uh, most important tissues to be used and fascia can be taken from anywhere. But in general, most people take the temporalis fascia People describe using fascia lata or rectus, but they're much thicker. And it's used for irregularities in patients with thin skin. I use, it, I use similar things to fascia a lot 
for patients with thin skin because I have a lot of patients with thin skin. Uh, the other one is dermal grafts like permacol, which is porcine derivative and alloderm, which is human. So it's derms which, in which all the antigenic material has been removed. So it's not, uh, it's not gonna be causing a reaction or infected and so on. Permacol is available in the UK. Alloderm is a similar one with the human derms, which is a bit more expensive, but it's also available. And I use these. This is the one I use, which is a permacol, uh, porcine derivatives, and I use it in the thin skin patients, as I explained. So when to use camouflaging? For me, and for example, in primary rhinoplasty, I've done the whole operation, final stage of the surgery. I'll find something that is asymmetric, irregular, or something I want to contour a little bit more, I'd use it. In my personal uh, experience, I find that this is most commonly used in the middle third of the nose. And I'm going to show you in a minute. So in primary rhinoplasty, basically to hide irregularities and asymmetries. So let's look at how I put this. So it's a very simple way of fixing these grafts if you're, doing, if you're using endonasal rhinoplasty. So I make some knots in that vicar repeat, go through this tissue. This is the permacol, and go through uh, the radix here to fix it on the dorsum of the patient with thin skin through the endonasal approach. Clearly that can be used in the open approach as well, same way, and that will fix the grafts, stop it from rotating and moving around. You fix this uh, vicar with a tape and you cut it flush with the skin one week later. So here's an example of a patient you see on the left, you see the marking here, irregularities, very, very thin skin. After the rhinoplasty, just putting the soft tissue is very smooth and it always stays smooth. This tissue doesn't absorb completely. NA symmetry is what you quite often you find in the middle third, more or less, in the primary patient. And sometimes we find things like significant like this. This patient presented with this asymmetry with the upper lateral cartilage on the left side is more debated toward the right and is, is smaller. You could do an open approach and do spreader grafts and so on. This patient didn't want that and doesn't have any functional problems. So can just use camouflaging. And you can see it here from the basal view. So what I did is use a camouflage graft from the septum to fill this area under the skin, as I will show you, like this. So after the rhinoplasty, the area is measured like this, and a drawing is made, and then cartilage is taken from the septum and is created and fixed in the same way through the biker repeat like this uh, into that area. And you can see the cartilage coming in a minute. And because she has, thin, uh, she has quite a thick skin, you can put a proper piece of cartilage without crushing it and it's not gonna show. The most important thing is you bevel the edges so you don't have any sharp angles. In. And this is what I've done, it looks like a boat, just the shape of the area of the deficiency stays there. And in the same way, as I showed in the other patient, you cut this vicryl and fix it with the stereo strips. So this is the patient later on. You can see the straightness here. So she had osteotomies, plus lowering the dorsum, a bit of tip surgery and the camouflage here, and you can't see it, give it a straight appearance. Similar patient, again, she didn't want a major surgery. That is trauma. Interestingly, see how low this middle third, but she does not have any functional problems. So only needed camouflaging. So here's a lateral view. You can see a bit of deviation of nasal bone and that depression here of the upper lateral on the right side. And the profile is fine, so you don't have to lower the profile. So the same idea, put camouflage material. The skin is medium, it's not too thick, not too thin. Minor crushing on that cartilage. Put it in and you get straight uh, anterior view superior view and profile. So that's the commonest use for camouflaging in the middle third for me in primary rhinoplasty. A lot of the secondary rhinoplasty will work by simple camouflaging without doing too much. Uh, and I will show some examples, for example, like upper, middle and lower third. I every now and then get referred patients with irregularities of the upper third, either a callus or lower uh, or part of the septum has been left without excision and so on, especially patient with thin skin, she's an older patient. In these patients, here we are, see that prominence here, is part of the bone and septum. When I remove this, I always put soft tissue material because I feel if they developed it once, they may develop again, irregularities with healing and so on. So I always put soft tissue. Fascia is ideal for these, and I use permacol majority of the time. So same idea, lowering that dorsum, grasping the bone, and then putting camouflage. You can see the contouring and the nice uh, brow tip lines here that was created by just some rasping, moving that cartilage, uh, dorsal irregularity, and putting fascia. Uh, in the middle third, again, as I said earlier, is similar to the patients in uh, I showed you in the uh, in the primary rhinoplasty. But interestingly, I will get patients. Here is a piece of cartilage I'm creating. 
and I bevel it in the edges, if you can see here, so we don't have sharp edges that show under the skin. I get patients every now and then. She had rhinoplasty before and she's got this curve. She doesn't want a big operation. I said to her, you have a middle third problem. You need to spread the grafts and open approach. She said, can you do something small? I said, if I put camouflage here, that would give an illusion of straightness, but I'm not sure it's going to make it 100%. This is what she wanted. And this is what we should do, what we did. It crushed cartilage from her septum. And she looked straight. I didn't do anything else apart from creating a small incision into cartilage incision, putting the crushed cartilage here. And you can even see it from the top. She's got that illusion of straightness. I haven't done anything else. Another patient at rhinoplasty previously does not like the dorsum. This is a bit of feminine appearance, he said to me, plus has depression on the left more than the right, but it's narrow middle third. And again, interestingly, it does not have any functional problems at all. So camouflaging works really well in that kind of patient with two grafts. So one on the left, larger one, one on the right, small one. Septum was intact, I've taken the cartilage from septum, created in the same way, and this is all I've done. This will create the straightness from the anterior view, but also on the profile, that bulk and creating that straight profile. So this is all what the patient had done. Simple technique uh, with camouflaging material with a cartilage. Lower third, a bit more complex, and in primary rhinoplasty and second rhinoplasty, I'd use camouflaging if there is irregularity and asymmetries or thin skin. Uh, uh, this is a revision case, which I'll show you, but thin skin is a, is a commonest thing with strong cartilage that can create this bossy or sharpness of the tip. This is a patient who had two rhinoplasties previously somewhere else. And I'd always use camouflaging in these. You could try to fix the tip and all on and do stitching and suturing and make them symmetric. I've developed this because of thin skin and the cartilage is strong. I'd use camouflaging. Again, in the tip, so many things I use, I prefer to use perichondrium myself. Why? It's just thinner and it's less, less invasive in the area of the, of the tip skin. I don't use permacol there. Fascia, very rarely, I use perichondrium that I take from the septum in the tip, plus cartilage as well like cap grafting for uh, symmetry. So if I show you this, this is a case I've just shown you. So I'm putting a cap graft from the septum, a very thin one here, uh, to just hide this sharpness of these domes that showed as bossy and irregularity on the skin. And then I cover that with perichondrium, which you can either use glue to stick there or just stitch it with Vicryl. And in this case, in particular, I stitched it with Vicryl. And, and that's what creates that smoothness and appearance of symmetry later on. So this is her before, you can see the twisting of the medial crora and the very sharp edges of these cartilage coming underneath the skin. And from the latter view, she does not like her profile as well, which was corrected. And that's later on, 18 months, symmetry, smoothness, and there's no asymmetries anymore. And the, the nose has healed well, and everything else was corrected as well. With camouflaging to the tip, but otherwise, it was a revision rhinoplasty through an open approach. So, so to conclude this, I think I've showed a brief review of various things to camouflage. And I think it's really useful for contouring, final contouring, when you've done the rhinoplasty and in the final stages, you want something, correct a little bit of asymmetry, you want to fill as an area of deficiency and so on, it's very, very useful. And it can be used either through an open approach or closed approach. It doesn't matter which approach you're using. You can use the camouflaging material in either approach. And I, it's one thing I always uh, teach my residents and my, I, I mentioned my lectures. When you've done everything and, and you're like stuck and you're trying to fix this and this thing, would camouflaging work here in the, in the end of the operation? And quite often you find it would work. Then you could just use it. And I think it's a very useful thing to think about at uh, the last stages of the operation. Thank you very much again for the invitation. And... Uh, uh, I hope we we'll continue these webinars for a while until we get to meet each other face to face again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hacham, for this very interesting uh, talk and impressive results. Thank you. And uh, for for personal reasons, it was not possible for Dario to join us, so we can start the discussion. And I will start the discussion, George, uh, with you. And there is a question, uh, how, if you perform the osteotomies with the piezo, how you preserve the, first, the first question is if you go in a subperiostal plane and how to preserve the internal uh, periostal layer, how are you doing that? Open, open your mood. 
on mute. Can you hear me now? Yes. Ah, okay, okay. Uh, the main idea is not uh, uh, to uh, just to preserve, is uh, avoid destroying it. For example, uh, the, the natural sequence of uh, a rhinoplasty with uh, standard um, tools is, for example, to make uh, the green stick uh, movement. Uh, then in uh, this case, you are going to, to destroy uh, the internal support. The, the, the main idea of using uh, um, piezo uh, is that you destroy uh, the external support and uh, uh, you, we use osteotomies or rasps or whatever uh, else um, tip you want and uh, 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 ma maintaining in uh, the surface or at the end of uh, the bone. Uh, this way, even if you, you unify, for example, all your osteotomies and you have uh, the lateral wall uh, totally uh, cut, uh, you don't destroy the internal uh, support. You don't make this kind of movement uh, we used to do with um, standard uh, techniques. Even in case, uh, for example, you destroy the internal support, uh, it's uh, nearly easy to, uh, to um, perform uh, some uh, drill, uh, with some holes by using uh, the piezo drill. For example, uh, you have uh, here uh, the, um, uh, the nasal wall. Okay, uh, you perform this osteotomy, this one and this one. And this part is totally mobile. Okay, uh, if you press it, uh, you are going to have a problem. You can uh, drill a hole here and here, and you can pass some sutures easily through these uh, holes and uh, make the uh, inclination you want and the, uh, the um, uh, stability is going to reestablish. George, you do, you do not elevate the internal periosteum on both sides. Oh, of course. It's uh, forbidden, of course. You, you don't uh, do uh, the, uh, any um, uh, elevation or on the internal side of the bones, only external. Okay, okay. Frank, the next, que uh, the next question is for you. There is a question, if you do this uh, turn and flap technique, and I like this technique very much because this is a structural technique that uh, supports, there is a balance between the, the size of the cartilage and the co and then uh, consistency, you know, and if you reduce the size, then you have to increase the stability of the cartilage. And I like this technique, but there is a question, how are the long-term results? Did you see any kind of complication? Did you see more swell swelling, more edema in a post-operative period? Mm. Well, I started to use this technique about one year ago. So I now see patients which have a one-year follow-up. Um, so there are not too many <laughs> up to now. Um, so after half a year or a couple of months, I, I don't see any aesthetical problems. Um, and now I start seeing patients uh, for the one-year uh, follow-up, but um, aesthetically, I don't think that it is a problem from a functional point of view in every, uh, as in every kind of turn in flap, uh, it doubles the size of the cartilage and the turn in doubles the size to the, to the nostril or to the internal part of the nose. So it might, you might lose some space uh, for breathing by using a turn-in flap. On the other hand, you have stability and you avoid collapsing in this area. So actually, I didn't saw any problems yet, but it might happen that I will see some problems in the future. I don't know yet. I, I can add, uh, Frank, that I see no disadvantage. I see advantages because if the combination of this turn-in flap technique together with an ala rim graft reduced dramatically the, the risks to have an ala retraction. 
because I saw also, I have followed also my cases uh, and uh, have uh, examined my cases after seven or eight years. And I saw a few cases with an ala retraction in the long term, you know, and therefore I use now routinely, I do not remove, I do not perform a cephalic trim and remove the cartilage, but I use a turn and flap technique. And, in, and if, if the cartilages are weak, then I use also an ala rim. I think this is a structural technique. What is your opinion, Heshon? Do you use also this uh, turn and flap technique? Yeah, I do. Uh, not in every single patient, but yeah, in a lot of patients. But I do agree. Uh, you realize after years that era prolapse or collapse of the ala cartilage is not uncommon, uh, especially if you would, uh, with extensive resection. So we try to preserve nowadays, and I, I use turn and flaps quite often, ala rim grafts as well, especially if there's a bit of ala retraction. And I still see patients coming to refer to me with ala retractions after uh, tip surgery. It is very common. It's two things, not just weakness of cartilage, but also retraction of the skin itself. So you try to support the skin with ala rim grafts is a good idea. And I think that some, some uh, surgeons probably use it in almost every patient when they've done extensive tip surgery. I think and Frank, yeah. there is also another question. If you perform this cranial dome suture and you, you rotate the, the lateral cruise a little bit more cephalically, is there a risk for an ala retraction? Did you see cases that you had an ala retraction? Well, actually, I would say um, just the opposite. I, uh, by using this kind of suture, as Jochen and Milos described, um, you support the ala rim and you avoid retraction or collapsing or pinching at the ala rim because you, you, you don't change the axis. You only rotate the lateral crust a little bit. And if this is the, um, uh, the um, ala rim and this is the, the lateral crust by supporting the, the caudal um, edge of the lateral crust, it supports the, um, the ala rim. And so I think there's no risk of ala retraction by using this kind of vertical uh, suture in the cranial part of the dome. And uh, Frank, there is also another question. Uh, where you exactly attach the Pitangi uh, ligament? If you, if you dissect the Pitagi ligament uh, in order to, to prevent, uh, an, let's say, a uh, soft tissue polypic, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and where exactly you attach again in the end of your surgery the ligament, uh, 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 the Pitangi ligament? Well, um, it's more or less uh, the, the part where I um, cut it. I just re-adapt it. Okay, that means in the, in the base in the base between the medial crura in the base yes. of the columella. Yes. Is that right? Yes. And how we know we know from papers, from FODA, for example, and other papers that publish that the most important thing for, for uh, to avoid a soft tissue polypic, especially in patients with a thick skin, is the tip support. So very often there is a loss of tip support, and therefore we have a soft tissue polypic in patients with thick uh, skin. Therefore, I think it was very uh, important that you have mentioned it, how important uh, uh, a caudal extension graft is uh, as a fundament to suture there the medial crura and to support the tip. How often, Hesham, do you use a, a caudal extension graft or did you use more often a caudal extension graft or a strut graft? It's interesting that uh, what Frank said that he doesn't like columella strut. I wouldn't go as far, but I say I would say that I don't use them as much at all nowadays. Over the years, we, we were taught when you're young to use columella struts a lot in the tip, and then discover it doesn't maintain rotation. It maintains projection maybe, but doesn't maintain rotation. So I really change it to using uh, extension grafts with tongue and groove technique quite often. So I do like extension grafts a lot. I do them. I use them uh, quite often, but I wouldn't say more than maybe 20% of my patient. Depends on the patient, obviously. But I prefer to use extension because it's fixed to the septum than a columella strut. I have a I have a question to all of you. Yeah. You know that uh, before 10, 15, 20 years there was an enthusiasm 
to use tip grafts, shield grafts in tip surgery. And uh, I have the feeling that this enthusiasm lost, you know, we, we, how often you use a tip graft or a shield graft in primary rhinoplasty? How often you do that, Frank? Um, oh, in, in many cases, but the only tip graft I use is a kind of cap or camouflage graft. If I perform a, a little cephalic trim, I use this cartilage to, um, to camouflage the domes or to um, define the domes a little more. Um, but I don't like tip grafts, for example, from the septum because uh, they become visible over time. And so the only tip grafts I use is the cephalic part. I, uh, when I perform, for example, trimming, then I use in, you know, in, in many cases to camouflage the domes a little bit or to define the domes a little bit more, um, this kind of cartilage. Did you did you morselize the edges of the of the tip graft? Mm, I think it's it's soft enough, uh, and you don't need to if you use um, um, uh, lateral crust cartilage. But if you use septum cartilage, then I think it's necessary. So Hesham, you what is your opinion? Uh, I do use shield grafts very occasionally. But it's all secondary rhinoplasties in patients with very thick skin who lost support and lost in projection. And after you've tried everything else, you still need a bit more. It's like a last resort. Uh, and if it's thick skin, it's okay. So, but I'd never use it in a patient with medium skin or thin skin. So it's rare, but I use it every now and then. I use cap grafts, like Frank said, and I cover it with perichondrium, like I showed. Is there is there a trick? how we should fix the cup graft in, in the tip area to avoid the dislocation? Is there a trick for you? I stitch the, I, I wish I showed the video. I, I go in the middle of a graft like this. So, and then I make a knot. So it now it has a stitch, then I stitched again. So it, it can go around like this, but still in the middle. Okay. I don't know. If and you, Frank? Yeah. Um, well, I, I, I use just, two stitches to fix the, the graft, but no special trick. The only thing I, I like to mention is, um, it's not, uh, Göxel um, from Istanbul, he, he was the one who described the, the double dome grafts to, uh, to get better highlights of the, of the tip defining points. And this is a concept I use in many times. So that means I don't use one single um, cap graft, but I use two uh, cap grafts for each dome, and this gives better highlights and um, um, uh, and tip uh, definition uh, to get better um, defining points. And this is a concept which is very helpful. To, so, meaning two tap, two uh, tip grafts or two cap grafts for one for each dome. Uh, and it's just fixed with one suture each. Yeah. George, how, how you proceed in these cases? Uh, I I usually am trying to to use a stepper extension graft, and uh, if we don't uh, want uh, this uh, uh, area to be stiff, I am trying to ask uh, Frank uh, Emission to stabilize it the the uh, medial crura only here and they leave this area a little bit mobile uh, if um, I, I, I started with uh, um, uh, with uh, uh, struts but um, uh, and now i am using struts only if uh, um, i don't have uh, enough uh, cartilage to to use it as septal extension graph and uh, concerning the, the extra uh, grafts, I, I could say that uh, in primaries, I use only cup grafts here for just to, 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 to give a little bit uh, extension here and to, to modify the supratip break. Uh, and um, uh, of course, uh, I, I sometimes, I, many times I could say, I use um, uh, dice uh, even in this uh, area. Uh, it's um, it's uh, a little um, a highly uh, small percentage of my primaries 
where I use silt grafts like uh, I used to. Uh, there is a question, George, for you, if it's possible to use the piezo through a uh, closed approach. Uh, good question. Uh, uh, when uh, when um, uh, everyone started uh, to use uh, uh, piezo, it was um, a, a, an exclusively um, a technique uh, performed uh, with uh, um, uh, with uh, uh, an open approach, uh, one hundred percent. But um, uh, as everyone gets better in the technique, we are starting to to use it uh, in a closed approach uh, also. For example, if you want to to remove, uh, we can separate in two. Uh, uh, to, two different uh, cases. Uh, the one is when you, you are trying to modify here only the dorsal area, or you want to do something here to, to uh, make uh, narrower the, the nasal bones, or to, to, um, uh, to rotate it uh, uh, to, the other, to one or the other side. If you go only here, uh, you can uh, go easily uh, with closed. Uh, and uh, uh, it's easy because um, uh, you even in closed techniques you have access uh, directly and you can uh, have the the uh, water flow we need water flow in order to avoid any any thermal damages uh, uh, but uh, here it's uh, nearly impossible because to to do the lateral even uh, low to low or low to high, uh, you need access here for the water flow. So this means that uh, you, you've you got to, to go with a full degloving from the one uh, nasophasal group to the other. There is a question to all of you from the participants. How do you measure the size of the caudal extension graft? How you do that? It's very variable. It depends how much extension you want uh, and how much rotation, uh, and it's variable. But I, I basically I just adjust it in a way it's going to be reaching the media crura. That's it. So that's the main thing. Exactly. I, this is also my opinion, and of course, uh, 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 make it a little bit bigger, and you can reduce it. Okay. This is also a, a standard. And how do you fix it? Do you go end to end or side to end? How do you fix it, Tesho? Side to side. side. I find end to end, it moves and can bend. I find it harder. So I put it side to side. But you have to make sure it's not too bulky. So sometimes I have to thin it a little bit. And I put three sutures, not just two, so it doesn't rotate. OK, and you, Frank? I do exactly the same. And you, George? Uh, look. Uh, mm. If uh, the the cartilage uh, the the cartilage is um, thin, uh, it's uh, uh, very easy to go side to, to side. Uh, if uh, uh, it is the the cartilages are uh, thick, uh, sometimes we can get uh, a kind of uh, a, a wide uh, wide new uh, septum. In this case, I'm trying uh, uh, an end-to-end -end and uh, use uh, a couple of uh, spreaders. For example, this is the, the main part. This is the septal extension graft. And we have to move to put one spreader on the, uh, the one side and the other or a spreader to the other side to, to fixate it. It's uh, very stiff. It's very, very good. But uh, uh, it's uh, much easier and faster to go side to, to side. And in this uh, uh, case, uh, you can uh, move it a little bit to the one side or the other if uh, you have to correct uh, a slight uh, deviation. It's uh, very uh, smart. And in tip surgery, which kind of sutures you use? You use permanent sutures or resorbable sutures? Frank? Yeah. Um, I, for one hundred percent, I only use um, resorbable uh, sutures. So and you, 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 Hashem? Same five zero PDS for the tip. And you, George? Um, uh, nearly, uh, um, nearly exclusively uh, PDS uh, five zero, 
uh, uh, the only exception is uh, sometimes when uh, I put some sutures through the nasal bones, for example, for a better uh, uh, stabilization after um, uh, the old co construction is uh, mobile. Uh, and uh, uh, sometimes uh, when I put uh, some sutures through the uh, anterior, uh, th through the ANS. I, I, I have operated last week a case. He had uh, a, a prolane, 5 0 prolane, 11 sutures in the tip area. Wow. And I can tell you, it was such a scarring, it was so difficult. So I cannot with, uh, dissect with a scissor. So I used an 11 blade to dissect all this area. And this is terrible. And I fully agree with all of you that we should use, I think, PDS 5 0 is the best uh, material. Uh, Hesham, if you if you augment the radix, which material you use? Do you use uh, uh, soft tissue material? Do you use cartilage? Because sometimes in thin skin, uh, if you have if you use uh, uh, diced cartilage or morselized cartilage, my impression is, and I had uh, one two cases in the long term. Then I saw I saw the pieces of cartilage. So what? Yeah. How do you handle the the problem? I discovered that radix is the hardest thing. You think the skin is thick enough, but after a while you'll see them. You put a piece of cartilage, it will show and contouring. Even uh, if you dice cartilage not small enough, it will show. Uh, sometimes soft tissue is not enough the size though. So I started using very tiny dice cartilage. So I really, really make it very, very almost like a fiber. Or I use the fiber, they have a paste, cartilage paste. But I have to have a lot of it. And I mix it with, uh, like Frank showed in his paper, fiber and glue or with the blood. So I started using that more lately, but you need something stronger. So more than less, more than common for me, I use very small, fine dice cartilage. Are you, are you a friend of PRF? Uh, yeah, well, I don't use, yeah, well, it's nice, but I haven't used it that much, to be honest. So I can't tell you, I don't have a lot of results in it. It's a new thing for me to think about a bit more. I've used it a couple of times. Yeah, I think it's a good idea. Hey, George, how do you manage uh, the radix? Uh, uh, I agree with uh, with uh, Hesam. Uh, I am trying to to make it a, a real paste. Uh, very slight, very slight, very small uh, pieces. Uh, I think it's okay. Uh, concerning the the APRF, I just started to using it, and I don't have enough. Uh, 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 patients to, to, to mention, but I think I find it uh, a very good uh, idea, e especially in the radix area where you can uh, use some sutures to, 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 you can pass sutures through APRF. It's, it's very good. But Frank, I, I you. Thank yeah, you. I, I usually I, I use a fine diced, really, really fine diced cartilage and, um, scratched cartilage as Hesham demonstrated um, in PRF. And this gives a three-dimensional construct which can be used to augment the radix. And um, we, we, about one year ago, we started a study on hybrid um, augmentation. And it's very helpful to do this, for example, in the uh, radix area to avoid visibility of the diced cartilage by using a small or a thin layer of fat in PRF on top of the cartilage. This is a very nice concept. Uh, if, you, if you have revision cases and you have a very thin skin, really, really thin skin, and uh, the patient has multiple previous uh, rhinoplasty operations, how do you handle this skin? I have made the experience that, uh, or in my hands, the best uh, solution in these cases is to, to include in my, my plan uh, also uh, temporalis fascia. What is your experience in these cases? Yeah, I always put a graft if somebody has very thin skin, especially if it's revision. Every patient with thin skin that's coming for revision, I'll warn them I'm gonna use something. A majority of the time I'm using the permacol though, which is derms from the porcine derms, and it doesn't absorb. It absorbs partially, you just have to make for it. Two thirds of it stays, so I use that. I have used fascia every now and then, but now nowadays I'm just using permacol most of the time. 
the important thing is the dissection. The dissection is the hardest thing, so I have to be really careful. I take my time. I think, I think in this case, in uh, cases, uh, hydro dissection is mandatory because without... just, they inject a lot, so it's hydrogen section. So you yes. thicken the skin and you stay deep and you do it slowly. Yeah. Okay. And you, George, how do you manage these cases with very, very thin skin and uh, multiple previous operations? Uh, uh, of course, the, the hard part is the dissection, as uh, you already mentioned, both of you. Uh, and uh, I'm trying to, to uh, put uh, a fascia, uh, uh, norm, usually um, from uh, uh, the standard uh, donor uh, areas. Uh, I, I had a lot of uh, uh, things about um, uh, getting fascia from the abdomen, but I have not... Uh, uh, tried it uh, yet, but uh, uh, definitely fascia. And uh, of course, uh, dice cartilage, something uh, uh, below the fascia. Frank, you? Yeah, as I just mentioned, we started to use um, um, this fat layer in, in instead of using perichondrium, for example, or fascia. Um, and this gives a very smooth, um, dorsum in, in, in uh, thin skin patients. Um, so if I augment, uh, I use fine diced cartilage in PRF, for example, and then a thin layer of fat cells in PRF. And this also gives a three-dimensional fat layer construct, which, um, yeah, which is uh, like a camouflage uh, the same way you can have by using, for example, temporalis fascia or something else. Just, okay. I think just one week ago, we published, no, we, we submitted, not published, we submitted our uh, paper on that together with Milos and Göxel and Aaron Kosins. We submitted a, um, a paper on it. So hopefully it will be uh, printed. Good luck, good luck. Yeah. And, uh, there is another question, Hesham, which is, which is the way or how can we achieve the, the smallest uh, diced cartilage particles? Which instruments you use? Personally, I just cut them with a knife. I keep cutting them until they're very small. I don't put them in a syringe. People do this and squeeze them out. You could do this. I just keep cutting and they're very, very small. In the majority of the time, it's my resident who's doing this for me. So you, you use an 11 blade? 11 blade, yeah. 11 blade, okay. Cut, 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 very, very fine and very, very small. I, I Gentlemen, that... there is a, a great response from, from the participants to all of you. There is a, also a, a last question about how do you handle the patient, general questions in rhinoplasty. Did you use Photoshop or did you... Uh, uh, go through uh, examples for, for uh, uh, through cases with your patients. What are you doing, Frank? Do um, you use Photoshop or you say, "Look, I have operated more than three thousand cases, and I will demonstrate <laughs> you a few of them." What are you doing? Well, I can tell you, I I preferred to um, to paint on photos of the patient, and. Yeah. Um, I did this for a very long time and uh, I always printed the photos and then I started painting how the nose should be after surgery and patient follow me painting and then they all said, can I see some patients? Can I see some examples? <laughs> and maybe two or three years ago, I started to, to morph or to use morphing for the patients. And from the first day I used morphing, they never ask for uh, to see other patients' examples. So I think painting is not that helpful because they can't really understand what you are talking about. But if you use uh, 2D, 2D morphing, like Photoshop or whatever uh, software you use, um, then it's much more helpful for the patient to understand uh, in which direction uh, the surgery should lead them. So I really or strongly recommend morphing. And you, Hesham? Yes, I've used morphing for 18 years, right from the start. I, I have a special software I've been using. And in the last year and a half, I have a 3D, but I don't use it regularly. I, 
I think the 2D is much easier to understand for the patient, but 3D can add to it. So you, you can use them together, but I, I prefer the 2D. I use it and I morph it and change it but reasonably, so I don't do too much. And the patients like it a lot. And like Frank says, most of them don't ask to see other patients' photos. It's true, yeah. And you, George? Uh, I'm using a Vectra 3D simulator for nearly 11 years now. And I think it's an excellent tool, not uh, just for, for understanding, but more for uh, communicating for, with the patient. And um, I could say that there is nearly no one that came uh, to me after the surgery, for example, one year after the surgery, and saying me that uh, 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 I want to compare the, the result, the post-op result and the post-op simulation. There is uh, no case. Uh, and uh, nearly uh, uh, no one asks uh, for me to show him some other works. And if he, he or she asks for something like that, I can uh, easily uh, tell him or her that uh, uh, this is your face. We are talking about your face. This is not a, a copy paste uh, job from, from the machine. This is not something that uh, the Americans uh, tried to, to, to make a copy paste. This is not an option in the, uh, the uh, Vectra simulator. Be careful with the nationalities. Uh, oh, like it. <laughs> <laughs> so gentlemen, it was a pleasure to share 90 minutes with you. I think it, this was a very interesting uh, panel. I thank you all of you and I pass uh, the word to Jean to close this webinar. Uh, of course, we will have also two other panels, uh, uh, in one in November and one in December. And I hope we will have a, such a strong uh, participation as uh, uh, this evening. So thank you again for your efforts, for your presentations uh, to be a part of this uh, webinar. So please, the word to you. Yes, thank you. That was uh, a fantastic webinar. And uh, one of our anonymous speakers has said, one of the best webinars I've attended. So uh, well done, guys. It was, uh, it was worth putting all the, uh, the work into it. Um, to our, uh, our audience, thank you very much for uh, staying with us. We uh, will have this on YouTube shortly, um, certainly within the next 48 hours uh, for uh, perpetuity. Uh, we look forward to our next webinar in the series, and that's on uh, the management of aesthesia and neuroblastoma. That, that will be our first skull-based webinar. So really looking forward to that. And that's going to be hosted by Issam Alabid from uh, Barcelona. Uh, I think, as uh, Yanis said, we've come to the end of time. Uh, he did a fantastic job in keeping it to time. It's just a shame that our fourth speaker, Dario, wasn't able to join us this evening. Uh, perhaps we can have him on another time. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, we'll draw to a close. Once again, thanking all the speakers and uh, good evening. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>